the sound of Cumbria. And all the music you love. The music you love. BBC. Yeah, hello again. Welcome to Evenings on BBC Radio Cumbria. Darren Milby coming up between 7 and 10 tonight for the next hour. Though we're talking sport with me, Paul Newton, the former Sunderland, Barnsley and Carlow United midfielder Chris Lumsden. And he's going to be joined by one of his former managers. Now it's Lumsden. Knock it back to Matty Glennon. Oh, look, some special <laughs> into the top corner. Oh. Yes! yes! Carl Hull have done it! Carl Hull have done it! We're back in the football league! Carl Hull have won by a goal to nil. Paul, what can you say? We said at the end we'll all be celebrating together. Well, that's what we've all wanted. That's what we've worked hard for. We've had problems that have come left, right and centre. We've dealt with it. This is what it's all for today. It's a fantastic occasion and we're going to enjoy it. The fourth official has picked up his bag. He's ready to go. And the, the referee, players over this yeah, side. The, the, he wants the players over this That's side it. because he's blown the whistle. And surely Carlisle United have got the championship. They've won by two goals to nil here tonight. Surely, 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 by a mathematical miracle, Carlisle United are going to end up as Division Two champions. Herrera tried to bring it down. Farinez is beaten, and Venezuela are beaten, and England have won the Under-20 World Cup. What an achievement for Paul Simpson and this group of players. And this is the moment that will stay with these players for the rest of their playing days. England World Cup winners. Yeah, not a bad CV, is it? A double promotion winner with Colour United and, as we just heard, a World Cup winner as well with England under-20s. Delighted to say we joined tonight by Paul Simpson. Paul, good evening. Good evening. Oh, you caught me off the hop there. I thought we were going to talk about Carlisle United. I've gone all emotional with that World Cup one. I forgot about that. Yeah, look, I mean, some great memories there. We just picked out three great memories from your time with Carlisle and obviously with England as well. I mean, you must look back, particularly with, with your hometown club, with great fondness. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, it was, um, as with all management jobs, it was a proper roller coaster. When, when I think back to everything that went on in, in, in the, the three years that I was there, it was it was absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, if you remember back when I went into the club, I went in as a player. You know, I, I got a phone call off Roddy Collins. I'd had one year as a player manager at Rochdale, um, left for for reasons, you know, which which just I don't know whether they've ever been reported but I left because I, I felt as though um, my authority as a manager would be undermined if I allowed the directors to to dictate what they wanted to and I wasn't prepared to do that I thought if I'm going to be a manager I, and it works I'll I'll get it to work my way if it fails I'll get the sack because I've done it my way so I wasn't prepared to do it any other way so I came into the club as a, as a player under Roddy um, it became really clear to me you know, probably even in pre-season that we had serious problems. And at one point I was, I, I, I rung Jackie on my way home from the training ground, from the stadium and said, listen, get a bottle of wine open. I think it's time to pack in. And she was like, no, no, don't do that. You know, we've just signed the contract. I said, nah, this isn't what I've signed up for. I don't need this. Luckily, she persuaded me not to. Um, she persuaded me just to give it a little bit longer and see if it changed once the season started. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't. We had uh, whatever it was. I think it was about four or five, four or five defeats, and we had a Friday morning where Roddy comes in and tells us we're all, we're, they, that he's been sacked, and and we move on from we moved on from there. So I went in as a player, um, realised the club was in serious trouble when I was in there as a player, but naively. Um, stupidly whether it was me my heart ruling my head i just decided to give it a go and, and thankfully i did to be honest with you so basically it's all down to your wife jackie that those bad to bad promotions <laughs> happened well it's down to her that i ended up carrying on playing and doing my cartilage and getting injured but probably because of that <laughs> it, it helped me to be a manager as well so it's it's yeah it was it was down to her persuading me just give it a go you know you you, you know what you agreed to and um, so so i went in and did it and it and it was it was strange. I mean, I, I think back to that Friday morning when um, when Roddy came into the changing room. I mean, Lummy knows what it's like. You're sitting in the changing room waiting to go out to training, and you know you wait for the 
for the coach to come and give you the shout or the whistle down the corridor and everybody goes traipses around to the back and we're all sitting there in the changing room the usual bit of banter going on in there um and it, I, i've got to be honest with you it wasn't it wasn't a great dressing room at the time it, it wasn't um, it wasn't a, a good place to be it wasn't the sort of dressing rooms that i'd been used to throughout my career and uh, roddy came in with um, Bugsy and Tony Elliott, who were his coaches, and basically said, right, I've been sacked. Um, I'm asking them to sack the other staff as well so we can all go out together. Thanks very much. ta -ra. walked out, and everybody's sort of sitting there going, come on then, give us a clue what we've got to do here. How, how do we go about this? So I don't know why, maybe just because I'd had a year of being a manager, I just said, right, what about if we do this? And I said... I'll take training this morning. Um, I wasn't actually fit for the game. I'd, I'd ripped my thigh in pre-season and I'd played about five or six games with a tear in my thigh just because I, I felt that I needed to play because we were really struggling. And, you know, Roddy had brought me in and I didn't want to be ducking out because I was injured. So I said to them, I'll take training. I ain't going to try and be clever. We're going to go out. We'll have a warm up. We'll have a, a little small sided game and we'll come in. And hopefully by the time we get back in tomorrow, somebody will have told us what's going on so we'll go out to train um, and at the back where there was the big bank around the training pitch um, I, I went out I literally set up a, f a few really simple bits and pieces um, and while I was taking training um, Roddy Collins and um, Bugsy and Tony Elliott all came and stood on the bank watching me so I'm like oh wow this is this is a difficult situation so during the session Dolly came running out the physio and Dolly said to me the chairman wants to speak to you I went back into the boardroom and he said look we'd like you to take it over the weekend um, and we'll have a chat to you again on Monday so I went back out Went up to um, the staff, I asked Tony Elliott, I asked John, uh, Bugsy, John Cunningham to come first and I said, Bugsy, listen, they've asked me to take the game tomorrow, do you want to help me? And he said, no, nope, I came with Roddy and I don't want to help you. I said, right, no problem, see ya. Asked Tony Elliott, I said, what do you want to do, Tony? I, you know, do you want to help me? And he said, yep, I definitely do. I went, brilliant, go and get your kit on, come and take the keepers for me then. So he, he came and joined me. And I went into the game on the Saturday um, didn't try and do anything clever. It was literally a case of let's stick us out there 4-4-2. Let's just see where we go. And between me arriving at the ground at about, I think I got there about 12 o'clock till about half past two when I made the final call, John Cunningham was helping me and then not helping me on three different occasions until we came to about half two and he said, oh, chairman won't give me the money I want, so I am going to help you. And I just said, no, I've made the decision now. In fact, it was earlier than that. It was about quarter past two because we hadn't gone to warm up. I said, no, I made the, the decision now. I said, you're not helping me. Just go home, get, get out of the building. I don't need you around here. So myself and Tony Elliott took it for that game. Um, and I suppose the rest is history, as they say. How much did the man opposite me in the studio tonight play a part in, in that revival for the club, do you think? Oh, he, he, there were was, was so many people, but Lummy was certainly one. And... I've got to be honest with you, I remember um, we had um, our, our chief scout was a guy called Russ Richardson, um, who I still speak to all the time now. Russ was a top, top bloke, really absolutely fanatical about, about scouting and about going watching players. And, you know, we would get to the ground sometimes and the team would change and I'd be ringing him at sort of quarter past two with the team sheets coming in saying, Russ, who's this? This name's on the team sheet. Who is it? And he'd be like, oh, yeah, he's a... He's a wide right, he likes to come inside, he does this, he does that, he's quick, he's not quick, whatever it would be, he, he knew everything about these players. And Russ called me before the start of the, um, before the, I think it was the start of the conference season, wasn't it, Lummy? Yeah, where, that was where it. He, he, he called me up and he said, I think we've got a chance of getting Chris Lumsden in. I was like, how? how how's that then? Because he was on a massive contract, weren't you, Lummy, at Barnsley? So, I was, you know, I'm like, I'm saying, no, 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 we, we can't do that, Russ. He went, honestly, Simo, we can. He said, I think we can do it. So anyway, we, we, we do the haggling, we do the deal, and we managed to get him in. And I think I'm right in saying, Lummy, did you come in um, the day before the season started and then, you, and then went straight into the game? Or, or was it a couple of days did you train with yeah, us? I remember you signed the week of the game, didn't you? Yeah, I signed a form to sign for a month, didn't I? Something like that, just so we could get it over the line and... Um, yeah, yeah, just a couple of days before the season actually started. Yeah, and and so that was 
you know, that was another piece to to change in the way we were as a football club. It was a for me the big thing we needed to do. We needed to change the mentality in the club. You know, I, I always remember a, a story where we uh, were travelling down on the Friday, and um, Andrew Jenkins used to travel with us, and and the the, uh, the doc used to travel with us all the time. I remember the doc sitting in the reception at Brunton Park one Friday morning as I, I've come back in from training. And I've gone, hi, hello, Doc, how are you doing? Good to see you, blah, 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 all of this sort of stuff. And he went, ooh, I'm not looking forward to this. And I went, what? He went, this journey. And I can't even remember where we were going. He said, this is, a, this is one of our bogey teams. And I just turned to him and I said, Doc, I'm going to have to say this to you now because you're absolutely doing my head in. I said, <laughs> every time I speak to you, I said, I'm starting to realise we must be the only club in the country who have 91 bogey teams. I said, because everybody is our bogey team. I said, shut your mouth unless you've got anything positive to say to me. And it was a bit stunned. And I thought, every time I speak to somebody, it's like, oh, we don't want to go here. We always lose here. Well, yeah, that's why we've been scrapping relegation. Can we not try and change that? And And that was the mentality that I felt we needed to change. So with the players that we were bringing in and... and you know, there was there was players who signed before Lummy and then players who signed after Lummy who totally changed the whole feeling about the place, changed the level of professionalism, changed the the attitude to, to what it meant to play for the team. And, and that was something that I was desperately trying to do. As you've said and touched on before, you got into the changing room. It wasn't great. Roddy Collins, etc. in there. Was it just, was there bad eggs? Um, yeah, there was, and uh, there were. I think deep down, there were actually good people, mm-hmm. but but they just. This sounds really arrogant here, but they just didn't know how to be professional footballers. There's, um, you know, everybody goes in a pub where there's a fo- where there's somebody stood at the bar drinking who he could have been a player, he yeah. should have been a pro, he he's he's better than these lads, and you know what? They're probably right. There's probably lads who are playing for Guildford Park, for Carlisle City, for North Bank who were really good players who should have been a pro, but something held them back, whether it was they couldn't deal with the changing room, whether they couldn't deal with the banter, whether they liked to drink too much, whether they did other stuff that wasn't really acceptable. You know, so it, it's th- there was people in that changing room who didn't know how to be good professionals, um, and, and that's what I found, you know. And, and my biggest challenge when I took over was actually stopping people drinking. You know, yeah. I remember... I remember one of the first weekends that it might have actually been my first week, the first time I got the job and um, the first caretaker job. And I spoke to Dolly during the week because at the time there was only me and Dolly. I hadn't brought John Ward in at this point. And I said to Dolly, "Um, I've got a bit of a problem next weekend, Dolly. I said, because on Monday I've got to take Jack into hospital in um, Blackburn for a little minor operation. And and he said, right, okay. so what do you want to do? I said, well, I'm going to give the lads Monday off. And he went, oh, don't do that, Simo. I was like, why not? He said, well, do you not know what they do? I went, no, I ain't got a clue. He said, well, after a game on a Saturday, there's a group of them. And he, he told me who they were. Yeah. He said, these are the lads. He said, there was a pub on um, the pub up near where the Holston Hotel is. And I think, did it used to be the called white the White something. Horse yeah, or the White it. Heart or something, <laughs> whatever it was called anyway. And he said, they'll go in there on the Saturday night and they'll get a lock in till about three in the morning. Then they'll be in there from lunchtime right through Sunday night. And if you give them Monday off, they'll start again on Monday. So basically they'll be drinking for two and a half days when they come in on the Tuesday. And I'm thinking, nah, people can't do that. You Footballers don't do that. But this is the sort of environment that we had. So in the end, I did have to take Jack into hospital for this operation. And we came in on the Tuesday and wow, uh, the smell of alcohol as I walked down that corridor in Brunton Park was incredible. And we had, we had, we just had players who that's how they lived the life. And it wasn't that they, they, they weren't vindictive, they weren't nasty people because of it. it. That's just what they thought was the thing to do. That's how they were. So we just needed to change that culture um, and change that feeling. And, and really, they weren't that bothered. They were on good contracts that they'd been given by the club and they didn't really care if they won or lost. It wasn't that important. And they, they had no shame in going out on a Saturday night after you've been turned over, you know, you know, losing at home against York first game of the season. I'm not bothered. Say what you like. You know, I did yeah. my best and that's all there is to it. And we just had to change that, that culture inside the football club, which, if I'm going to be honest, I hadn't got a clue whether I'd be given the time to do it. 
you know, we, we would go in, it was my job in the morning, I would go in just to say good morning to everybody with part of me being civil and saying good morning to everybody, but I was actually going round to speak to people to see who smelt of alcohol, because mm -hmm. I knew I hadn't had a drink the night before we were going training, so I knew if somebody else has had too much, I could smell it. And it was literally, you know, I remember on a couple of occasions I have to go, you know, go up to somebody and say, morning, you're right, and go, oh, right, uh, have you just got a minute and pull them out and say, just get yourself changed and get off home. Yeah. Like, what for? I said, because you smell of alcohol, you're not you're not fit to train, could you go home? And send and I had to get them out of the building and send them home, and I had to do that a few times. And then the feeling changed because I then go in and um, I think, I don't have to do that now because yeah. I know that somebody else is digging them out. So Arnie, Hendo, they were the start. And then we had, then we brought in Kev Gray and Tom Cowan who, who then gave another bit but it wasn't just them either it was because we had good people in there anyway but they just weren't allowed to be a, they, they weren't enough of them to be a strong voice so yeah. people like Murph and Chris Billy stepped up to the plate and were and suddenly became leaders um, and and regardless of what anybody thinks of their level of ability or the number of games they played they actually helped me to change the feeling and the attitude in and around the changing room did you think on that, uh, you know, the great escape, so to speak? We spoke to Matty Glennon last week and he was convinced you were going to do it. It was some effort, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, It was close. Um, I, I've got to be really honest with you. Um, when we got to Christmas, no, I didn't think we had an, any chance whatsoever of, um, of staying up. I thought, we, I thought we were so far off it, we, we were never going to do it. Um, I think, you know, if, when I remember back, I remember going on a run of results um, and the, the final one was Oxford away. I don't remember what part of the season it was where we had, I think it was 12 straight defeats in the league. Um, we, had a, we had a win in the, tr in the middle of it and I think it was in a, I think it was a cup game. It wasn't a league game anyway. We had 12 defeats and through this time we were... We were working through CVA where we, could, we couldn't change the squad. We were going with what we had, which wasn't good enough. I remember going away to Oldham in an FA Cup game and leaving the house in the morning thinking, I can't see how we can keep a clean sheet today and I don't know how we're going to score a goal in an FA Cup game away at Oldham. I thought, may as well put the FA Cup final suits away because we ain't going anywhere. And we lost the game 3-0, so I was right. Um, and, and we had this run of results where we, we couldn't get a win for anything, but... We'd, we'd started to change it. We had Tom Cowan come in because Dundee went into administration. Tranmere wanted to get rid of Kev Gray, so we've signed him. Um, and when we went to Oxford, I'm not sure if Preecy was with Andy Preece was with us at that point. Again, I made a cheeky call to Preece. He had just been sacked off Berry, and I just rung him and I said, listen, when I got the sack, I wanted to get back on the bike again, playing football. Um, do you fancy getting on your bike again and coming and playing football again? And he went, yeah, I'd love to. So we brought him in. Um, so we started to get different players. And when we lost to Oxford on the, um, on, on the, I think it was in, it must have been early December. We lost to Oxford and I remember walking off thinking, wow, we're close here. Yeah. We're actually getting, we're getting to a point where I think we might be all right here. Um, but I think we were about 17 points adrift at the bottom of the league. <laughs> and then the following week, in fact, another no, following week was when Preecy came in because we, we beat Torquay at home um, just before Christmas. And that was that for me. Well, the Oxford game was the start of it, even though we lost. But then that that way that the team then developed over the next part of that season was just I knew we were in a good place. Yeah. And even though we went down, I still felt we're actually doing all right here. You know, we're doing, we're, we're in a good place. And, and in a way that's probably, there was two, two reasons at the end of the season when we, when we, um, so before, before the last game of the season, which was away at Doncaster, I got a phone call from Blackpool to ask if I would go and be their manager. Blackpool were in league one at the time we were in division three. Um, and there was two reasons why I turned it down. I actually felt we were doing okay and we had a chance of being successful and I just knew I couldn't leave Carlisle after taking them down into the conference. I knew I had to stay and and try and have a chance to bring them up. Um, so, the, you know, I ended up staying and going into the conference, I felt really, really confident that with a few little additions, we could have a right good go and get ourselves back out of the league. Yeah, and is that the summer, Fred? took over 
Yeah, he was. Yeah, Did he you have was, a meeting um, with Fred about it? I think I've heard it before about your best 11. Or you made you write something yeah. on the board. Mm. He called me in, sort of about, you know, you hear that Fred's story's taken off. I didn't know Fred, I'd never met him before. Um, I just, I, I'd, I'd done a bit of research into him, um, never met him. I get a phone call about half five one night, said, uh, Paul, it's Fred's story, uh, can you come into the ground? Well, as a manager, when that happens, you think, oh, no, I'm getting the sack. So I go in, um, he said, right, I've took over, I've taken over from John Courtney, um, and I'm going to run it properly now, I'm going to run it as a business. So we sat in the office at the back of the, the Brunton Park, and he said, uh, on your whiteboard there, write me down your best 11. So I wrote the best 11, he went, so right, all of them, let's sack them, the rest of them. So I was like, oh, you can't do that, Fred. He said, what do you mean you can't do it? I said, well, for a start, you need subs. And he went, right, well, who would, you be, who would your subs be? And I don't know if it was two or three subs at a time, so I wrote the subs. He went, right, let's sack them then. So, um, so we ended up having a conversation. I went, listen, you know, I understand what you're saying, Fred, but we can't, it doesn't work that way. And um, I've got to say, for me, John Courtney was a top, top bloke. Yeah. I, I, I thought he was a really great fella. But people talk about what I did for Carlisle United. The man who made a massive difference for Carlisle United was Fred Story. The way that he came in and ran that football club as a business properly. Um, it, we ended up for about two months, me and him, being good cop, bad cop, him obviously being the bad cop, yeah. me trying to be the good cop and trying to settle players' contracts and give them a deal to get them out, which saved us money. Um, and and his support for me was absolutely fantastic. You know, if, if I would go to Fred and if I could justify that it was the right thing to do to make us successful, he would do it. And one of the things he always said to me was that, I'm a rugby bloke. I had yeah. no idea how tall he was. He was a frightening size. So trying to, me trying to have an argument with him was just <laughs> incredible. Um, but we had quite a few. Um, but he, he said to me, if ever I start trying to tell you about football, you have to tell me to F off. And yeah. I was like, yeah, all right, Fred, I'm five foot seven and you're six foot eight. Do you think that's going to happen? He went, seriously, you have to do it. And I think over our time together, there was probably only twice that I had to say it to him, but um, I survived it and we got through it. But him coming in was, was a massive thing for us. He totally changed the football club, totally changed <coughs> the business side of it and um, and helped us to, to move forward. So this is your first, you know, the Rochdale one's gone before. You kind of took over halfway through the season, the scene before. This is your first... <coughs> season as you've had the pre-season proper manager getting a squad together mm. you've got play people in place who you like who you think will do a good job for you in the building was a kind of optimism going into the conference that right we're a big club in here we're going to get it right mentality wise player wise and, and really go for it yeah there was yeah you know you, you think we we did have a good side and we'd that summer, uh, before we got you, we'd signed Carl Hawley. Yeah. He'd come in on a free after getting released. We'd signed um, Kieran Westwood as a young keeper who I thought in time's going to come in. Um, we signed a young kid called Carlos Rocker, mm -hmm. who I remember from that, going back to that FA Cup game at Oldham, he absolutely tortured us on the day, so we signed him. And I just felt we were in a really good place. We had a good group of players. Um, the fixture list comes out and it's a proper kick in the teeth yeah. and you realise where you're at and you've got Canvey Island at home um, but you know we, we had a massive crowd I, I think we had I don't know if it was about seven yeah, or eight thousand I had couldn't on the believe day. it we that had... day I walked out mm. against Canvey Island yeah. that was it was it was unbelievable it was like right if we get going here it, 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 same with me resonated I, with me that this was a club we could get at places Without a doubt, and that's what that's what you remember. I remember that one. I remember going to Northwich during the mm -hmm. week and taking thousands to Northwich. Suddenly, you think, "Wow, what's going on here? We we could be in. You know, we, we it could be good." And and we had. I think if if I, I don't know how much you remember of it, but we had a really really good start to the season. Yeah. It was us and Barnet both mm -hmm. flying, and then Barnet came to Brunton Park and properly pulled our pants down yeah. and beat us. Um, and you know we deserve to be beaten and that was a that was a little bit of a wake-up call to us and the thing that i was finding is everybody thought that we were the big club because we had a big fan base we were massively you know we were the biggest budget and all that sort of stuff and i'm finding out i'm i'm speaking to to paul <coughs> excuse me to paul fairclough trying to see whether we could sign players from there trying to sign players from Accrington stanley 
they were paying way much yeah. more money than we were doing and i'm thinking how on earth does this happen i still to this day don't know how it was happening um with the way that the the conference were with with budgets and how much you could spend on your on your player's salary but they were paying fortunes out and that was a real wake-up call for me and I, I've got to say it, it sort of changed my whole perception of that league from that point on thinking wow this isn't yeah. going to be as, uh, as straightforward as I thought it was going to be. Yeah I think the floods came didn't it and it kind of rejuvenated us but I, I said you know we probably don't get enough um, well I didn't look back on it and how mentally strong we were that time because as a manager, that must have tested you because we were getting into training, weren't you? And you, you were trying to find us places to train and, and to play. Yeah. And, and, and obviously it's going to derail you a little bit, but we went through a little bit of a bad spell. But we came out the other side and I just feel the squad, we got the training, you'd tell us where to go and we'd all just be in it together, even if it was 30 minutes of running up and down the gym at the Sands, then so be it because we knew yeah. the end goal, what we wanted to do. Yeah, it it is amazing when you look back at it as to how we how we got ourselves through it, you know, from, we were playing Crawley away the day that, uh, yeah. the, the night that, that Carlisle flooded. Um, and I woke up in the hotel that morning and saw my uh, club Rover floating in the car park <laughs> at the stadium. And you think, wow, how do we get out of this then? And, you know, we went from there, we're playing games of football at, at, uh, at Workington. We tried to get one at Gretna, but it got, uh, the pitch was frozen, mm -hmm. couldn't get it on. And, and we trained at, every school that we possibly could um you know we, we just did what whatever we had to do and i think you know you talk about coaching and organization most of our sessions involves being in that little gym at the neil sports center where we'd do little stupid shuttle races yeah. we'd have a possession with like three thousand bodies in a little small <laughs> area where you hardly get a touch of the ball we had little small sided gains i remember doing set plays against the the big goal posts mm -hmm. painted on the side of the wall where you've got no sort of um no spatial awareness of what's around you. You can't get a full picture of what you need to do, but we got through, but we yeah. got through because we had strong characters. We had good players. And um, although we did have a, a proper dodgy run, we then picked ourselves up and went on good runs to, to at least get ourselves into the playoffs. Yeah. Just before that playoff, it was three points I kind of took from that conference season. We drew with Gravesend at home 2-2. And you took us into, I don't know if you remember it, you took us into, um, I think it was Foxy's, the bar. And before training, you just said, listen, whatever motivates you, I don't care. If you're motivated by football in your career, then we've got to get out of this league. If you're motivated by financial gains, Fred's up the bonus again. Now, I don't care which mm. motivates you. Let's all come mm. together and let's just give it a right go till now until the end of the season. And, and I think that was good because... There are people who are motivated by different things, aren't there? And, and there was certainly mm. people there who was the financial side would have appealed to them. Going up a division would have appealed to them. And, and that, that was just a, a real standing point for me where I thought, yeah, that's the meeting that we needed at that time just to clear our heads and, and go again. Yeah, yeah. Pe people do. People people are motivated by different things. Some, some it's... Um I'm going sports science here. It's probably the first time I've ever done it. It's it's you're in. You've either got some sort of intrinsic motivation that you what you just that it's that feeling of wanting to be successful, or it's an extrinsic one where you've got a medal or you've got a, a bonus or whatever it might be. There's diff, there is different types and. It's whatever rocks your boat. I don't actually care how people do it. I don't care if somebody's in the changing room banging a big bass drum to get themselves going or somebody's sitting quietly in a corner. We all we all go about it in a different way. Um, and, I, the, you know, you talk about that story. I remember the Stevenage away game where we lost with two late goals. Yeah. And I remember that as being a, a really, really big turning point because... They were jumping around and banging on the doors. And I remember having to stand in the doorway with Kev Gray, Andy Priest or whoever else it was, Tom Cowan, wanting to get out and fight. And I'm nearly getting flattened. And I remember saying then, it, it, you can't change that. They've, they've just beaten you. And they've, you know, we can't, we've got no answer to that. We are big Carlisle United who've just been beaten off Stevenage. And you've allowed that to happen now. If you want to get your own back, the only way you do it is on the football pitch. So if you want to, do it right between now and the end of the season. Because my, my view has always been in my career that if you do things right, you will have your day. You'll get your day again, whenever it might be. It might be this year, it might be two years' time. But if you do it right, you'll get your day. And 
by a crazy quirk of the footballing <laughs> gods, our day came at yeah. Stoke City that night. Yeah, but yeah, um, Kieran was on and he said that the crowd pulled him in that day because Kieran had came into the team, hadn't he? And he kind of mm. had a he said himself through not through a couple in, but he had a bit of a a bad couple of minutes towards the end of that game and, and the way they went on he was emotional and the crowd Carlisle mm. United crowd pulled him in there and Kev Gray was on and said as you said he was ready to, to fight then but we got our day but yeah. the older shot mm. game away we spoke about it, the first leg of the playoffs we just didn't turn up I felt there was no. a turning point where I think Kev saw Matty short a little ball and I think he had an open goal, one of the lads, and he missed from quite a distance out. And I just thought, right, That's right. That, that, I think this is it. I went from now. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it is those little things, isn't it, that turn the games. Um, and and the, the the strange thing was about the, the Kieran Westwood. I knew that Kieran was... A, I mean, I signed Kieran on the strength of watching him warming up in a pre-season friendly at Barrow because I was watching him thinking, oh, wow. He was, he'd come on trial for us and I watched him making saves in the warm-up and I watched him striking the football with his left foot thinking and I, I was stood at the other end of, of the Barra Stadium watching him warming up and as Dennis walked past me, Dennis Booth come off the pitch from the warm-up I said to Dennis, don't allow me to let Kieran Westwood leave this ground without signing tonight and he went, why? Why? I said, Den, I said I've never seen anything like it, he's going to be a keeper so I, I knew Kieran was going to be good but he couldn't get in the side because Matty was yeah. doing so well and I brought him in. Um, I brought him in for a couple of games, and one of them was the Stevenage away game, where he got absolutely smashed in, in that Stevenage game. They were putting things under the crossbar and bundling him into the net and everything. And he played. He played a few more games after that, maybe one or two more games afterwards. But he then picked up an injury. So Matty Glennon had had the kick up the backside yeah. that he needed just to get himself going again. But Kieran had also had a little bit of a taster of it. And from that moment, you know, as much as, you know, you get wins, you get people who are scoring goals, you get you get all the things going on. Matty Glennon's penalty saves were the things that, that, that turned it all around in that game against Aldershot. You know, I mean, I don't know how many times during that those two ties I thought, ah, forget it, yeah. we, we've got another season in the conference. Or I've got the sack, whichever, <laughs> whichever was going to come. I thought, I thought that game we... Um... We destroyed them for the first hour, and I think it was just after Homer hit the ball, uh, hit the post with a header about 55 minutes an hour or so, which would have made it 3 0. That it just, we went on the back foot a little bit, and then lo and behold, last mm. minute, they score that goal. And as you say, yeah. we get to the, the, the penalties, and I'm kind of looking, thinking another year or whatever in the conference, and then it just, it just yeah. completely. Overturned. Uh, just, yeah. just to this day, you just listen to it and you think, how? You watch it and you think, how? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, I look at it and the fact that the penalties were in front of that Warwick Road end and that they, I think on that particular night they they urged Matty to make saves. I think they sucked the ball into the back of the net from our penalties. And, you know, I, I think over the season, I think we fully deserve to go to the yeah. playoff final. Whether whether over, you know, if you look at how badly we played in that Aldershot game, we, I remember getting back on the coach and saying to Dennis and to Dolly on the coach, we got away with one there. Yeah. To come away 1-0, we were so lucky. But we, we were still in the game. At 1-0, you are so in the game. And, and the, we knew that, Coming in the home game at Brunton Park, we knew we'd get a good crowd, and again we filled the place. The atmosphere on the night was incredible, um, and in the end, uh, you know, I think because of the way the season had gone, we, we we deserved to go up. Oh, definitely. I think as soon as we got off that pitch that day, and, and we knew we were going to get Steve in the duel, I just felt the way the penalty shootout went that we were going to win it. I just felt mm. I was calm, very calm about it, and thought I thought Hereford might have caused a bit of a problem because I thought Hereford were fit, agile and would pass it around and, and can move you around where I thought Stevenage were quite one dimensional and I just thought we can stand up to that and yeah, we can definitely. go to Stoke and we can we can beat them. Well on a good pitch, um in a in a proper football stadium, I fancied us to do it. And I've got to say, um I thought he tried to be too clever, um Graham Wesley on the day as well, because 
when I think back to the games that we, they played against us, remember the remember George Boyd, yeah, um, yeah. who he was an unbelievable mm-hmm. footballer. I, I really do think he was a, he was as good as any player who played in the conference, mm-hmm. um, and they had a big organised. Uh, and I've got to say it, they were a horrible yeah. group of people. Um, the staff as well on the sideline, they were horrible people. Um, and and I when we got the team sheet and he'd left George Boyd on the bench. I thought, oh well, interesting. I'm quite happy about that. I'll take that one. Um, and and then, you know, I think the game had gone away from me, even though they were still in it because it was only one nil. Even when they brought George Boyd on after an hour or whatever he came on, I, I don't think they had enough. We were so resolute in the way that we defended that day and 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 hung on and 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 got ourselves through to the end. Your feelings on the final whistle? Mm. I've got to be honest. It is just pure relief. Yeah. It really is. I don't. I didn't. Um, I can't even say I enjoyed it because it, it's just pure relief. Because it, I knew how important it was. Even though Fred had been saying to me, "We don't have to go up." You know, I'm. I'm. If we get to the playoff final and lose, I'm quite happy. We don't have to go up. But I knew deep down we did need to get yeah. up. I knew. I knew we needed to because. I just didn't think, and and also I knew the financial implications of not going up at your first time round. You know, you get when you come out of the of, of the league for your first season, you get half of the football league money, but in the second season, it goes down to about ten grand. It's a massive drop in money, and um, I, I knew that we had a we, you know we had a, a real problem if if we weren't able to go up. You know, if if I go back to the the last game of the season on the Friday night, our last game of the season. We were at home, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I can't even remember who, who Exeter, we were playing I against. Was. Exeter, you're right, yeah. So we're playing Exeter at home, and I get a phone call on the Friday night from Fred to say, uh, we've got a problem, Paul. I was like, why? Well, what's the problem? He said, we've had a phone call from the conference, and um, they're going to dock us points because we've exceeded the, the financial fair play. And I went... Well, no, no, they can't do that. I said, we, we've got an agreement. When you when you first, I don't know if it's still the case now, your first season that you get relegated out of the league, because the players are on football league contracts, you get a special dispensation that you're allowed to spend a little bit more money while you clear your decks a little bit. So we had this agreement in place, but on the Friday before that last game, they said, no, you're losing points. So Fred, me and Fred spoke about it. If we beat Exeter, we were still going to be in the playoffs. If we lost, we were out of the playoffs if they were going to deduct points off us. So I'm, I, I've sort of made a decision. There's nobody else can know about this. I'm the only person who is going to go into this game knowing that we need a win here. Otherwise, we have got a major problem. So I didn't say anything to anybody. And um, we go to the game. We lose. <laughs> yeah. and we lose the game. I still didn't know if we were going to get points docked and whether we were in the playoffs. So I don't know if you remember, Lummy, I said to everybody, can you just all hang around here for, for five minutes and I, I've just got to go and find something out and I'll come back to you. Thinking, I'm coming back in to tell you all, we haven't made the playoffs, we're, we're finished. So I go into the boardroom and I, and I get Fred. I said, Fred, have you got a minute? Yeah, yeah, what is it? I said, uh, have you heard anything from the, from the league? He went, what do you mean? I said, have you heard anything about us getting points deducted? He went... Oh, I got a phone call last night. Yeah, he said um, that they've made a mistake. It's not happening. We're okay. We're in the playoffs. <laughs> and I just looked up at it and I went, "Do you think you could have told me that before the game, then, Fred?" He went, oh, "I just forgot. Never thought about it." And you, you, you just think, how you know how crazy is that? So I ended up coming back in and saying, "It's all right, fellas." And I didn't even tell anybody what it was. So it's all right, fellas. Uh, we're in on whatever day it is, and we'll start preparing for the playoffs then. But I went into that game. I thought. But that final whistle went after that Exeter game, thinking, oh, wow, well, how, yeah. how do I break this to everybody? How am I going to deal with this? So, um, anyway, thankfully, we didn't have to do it and we got away with it. That was the third time you should have told Fred to air, uh, you know what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I just realised that wasn't the right time then. So, no, it was, it, was, uh, it was better to leave it. So, League Two, what for me, personally, how Carlisle had been over the years, I would have took easily mid-table, just consolidated, mm. keep building the club and enjoying what we were doing did you did you think come on momentum all of the previous years whether i'd been at carlisle or whether i was somewhere else and watching gillette soccer saturday results coming in with carlisle just avoiding relegation for one reason and another i didn't want a season of that i wanted to have a season where we could 
I just thought, let's just have a bit of mid-table mediocrity. Yeah. Let's just do a bit of that and, and steady the club down and keep building and building. Fred was never talking about getting promotion. That didn't even come into it. Um, you know, it was just keep doing what you're doing. We're doing all right. We'd had a, you know, we'd had some, uh, I think we'd had a final down at um, at Cardiff um, or maybe that was the season that we we, we got, you know, we, we won the league. We, you know, so we were, we were bringing in good crowds. We were yeah. winning games of football. We were, we were actually bringing some revenue into the club, which was helping. So everything seemed really good. Um, even though, I mean, I remember there was a there was a point in the season, quite early on in the season, maybe September, October time, where um, we had a bit of a dodgy run of results. Yeah. We'd lost lost a few games, and Fred Fred called me and said, uh, "You're going to get a call off off Radio Cumbria. Uh, they want you to go in to do a morning show tomorrow morning. The um, I don't know what it's called, the drive show or something. People going into work in the morning." I said, "All right, well, what's that for?" Then he said, "Well, they've asked me and you to go in, and basically they want me to give you a vote of confidence because of the results." So I went, "All oh, right, okay." I said. Uh, <laughs> I said, well, what do you think? He went, do you need me to give you a vote of confidence? I went, not if it's the normal vote of confidence. I'm going to get the sack tomorrow. <laughs> I said, if you think if you think I'm doing all right, then yeah. no, I don't need you to do it. I said, I, I, I know what we're doing. And he went, right. Well, in that case, I'm not going on it then. So I said, all right, then I'm not going on. So anyway, the next morning I listen um, to the programme because I'm driving into the ground. And basically what they'd done, they'd sent a, a roving reporter into the centre of Carlisle to ask... Um, about Carlisle's results and I always remember it I remember whoever the reporter was asking an old lady said uh, oh do you follow football no I don't follow football she said uh, I watch for the results but I don't follow it and he said oh how do you think they're doing she went oh they're not doing very well are they and the, the guy said well do you think they you think they should sack the manager and she said well if that helps get better results then maybe they should and I thought, wow, I could have been sat in the studio listening to this. Um, and, and thankfully, Fred didn't need to give me a vote of confidence. He didn't give me a vote of confidence. He just told me to get my finger out and start getting some results. And, and from then, things started to change. We had a, we had a, a few, few, well, no, we went on a really good run. Yeah. We went unbeaten for, for a few games, got, got wins, big wins. And I don't even remember when the point come where I thought, you know what, we've actually got a chance here. I, I can't remember what it was, but we 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 were a we were a good side. Yeah. It was as simple as that. You know, we'd added we'd added some quality into Zigo. it with, with people. Zigo Ar Arinaldi coming in. Um, I think of people like Danny Livesey. I think of people like Bridgie, who who just came in and were just different, different yeah. personalities, different footballers that that just took us to a different sort of level. Does he go, just his influence? I mean, we were having our dinner and he'd have a glass of wine and we're like, what, what's going on here? But <laughs> he, he, would, he would just show us the professional that he had and, and it was just yeah. a good bonding session. I just thought, yeah, we've got a real chance. And then Bridgie started hitting hitting his form and, and Carl was on fire. And I just thought in the end, we kind of, yeah, we did have a sticky yeah. spell near the end, but I think that was just getting over the line, but we were just destroying. A lot of falls and five nils, Darlington's away when... David Hodgson's had a little bit of a go at way as well, so it, we just were steamrolling was, people. We were. There was a lot of things that went on, and there was what we had was we 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 had a really good group who were all together, and um, we were all all fighting for the same thing. Really good professionalism about it, but we also had that extra bit of quality. And I remember games. Um, I remember being uh, one in particular. I remember playing Lincoln at home, who were yeah. horrible, yeah. a horrible team to play against. Grimsby at home in that in that end of the season, where we didn't play well. We were starting to get a bit nervous. We didn't play well, and then Bridgie would pop up. He was hopeless for eighty nine minutes, <laughs> yeah. and he would pop up and score, and you'd win the game one nil. And and people are like, ah, oh, it's lucky. Well, it's not lucky if you've got good players because they'll they'll find a way to win. It doesn't matter how you do it. You know, Grimsby and Lincoln are going to come and make it a really horrible game. They don't want a football game against us because we'll we'll turn them over. So we had players who could add that little bit of quality. You could find that through ball, that that penetrative pass that had put Bridgie on the on the you know back in on one on one with the goalkeeper we'd have people like kev gray who would throw his head on the line to go and block something yeah. tom cowan who'd run through a brick wall you know we had we had players who who would all go and do that to try and get results and 
we, we had that bit of quality about us that could finish teams off. Yeah, and the typical Carlisle way, we went to Mansfield to have a party and we left it till, what, the 94th minute for Carl to uh, equalise. And I've always remember you being a bit disappointed because they told us to take... They, they wanted us in the changing room after we got promoted, didn't they? They, they said, don't go back out and... Yeah, um, and then the fans thankfully stayed because we ran back out, didn't we? And we, and we got out there and yeah. had a few celebrations. Well, I think it, it's Mansfield has actually played a part for Carlisle over a few years. Yeah. You know, we had the the year we got relegated, we we ended up getting a draw with Matty Glennon making a last minute penalty save. I think it was at Mansfield to to take it to the second last game of the season, and then to to do it that day to get promotion, and and suddenly you've got a club saying. You can't go and celebrate, and you're thinking, oh, how does that work out? Then you know it's it's just crazy. But you know, thankfully the fans did stay, probably because they were locked in. But but we were able to go out and celebrate. And um, again, I remember going up to the to the um, press box on that day at the back of the main stand and speaking to Derek Lacey and seeing my family that day who were at the game. And you just think. Wow, we've been through so much yeah. to get to this point. It's just a fantastic feeling, isn't it? Yeah. And then the Stockport game was, you know, nil nil went right, didn't it? Because Stockport could stay up. We had a celebration on the hmm. pitch, and then I didn't even know. I didn't even know what was going back on at Brunton Park, and then we pulled on to Warwick Road, and the place was absolutely chocker, wasn't it? To get to the ground, yeah. and, and we got the presentation, which was, you know, really really great night for everyone. And as you said, everyone's family was upstairs. Everyone was involved, mm. and just sat there for hours just having a right laugh yeah, there there's so many things that you can look at isn't there i mean i look at the game before as being the rochdale game as being yeah. you know i've spoke a couple of times about the football in god's looking down and i think for us to actually achieve and really we were champions that night barring an absolute disaster on the last day goal difference wise so for me to go back to rochdale and to and for us to finish it off at that point was just unbelievable and, and thankfully it was that way because I'd made a decision that that season, um, early on in the season, the, the light bulb moment came on for me that it was time to retire um, and I needed to hang the boots up um, away at Bury early on in September. I'd made that decision. So I'd hardly been involved. So because we were like barring a disaster we were already champions I, I, I decided to be sub for that Stockport game to come on um, I was hoping we were going to be 3-0 up and I could come on and just enjoy the last few minutes of a game and hang my boots up after it but coming on at 0-0 um, I, I just remember the supporters all down the side of the ground was incredible um, and there was a moment in the game that I, it, I look back and I would have never done it but we had a free kick and I I whipped this free kick over the wall near the end and I hit the crossbar and I think if I'd have scored that I'd have just walked straight off to the other end and down the tunnel and that would have been my <laughs> last involvement as a professional footballer so game 808 could have finished with me coming on as a sub and walking off Yeah, I think you would have seen me and Bridgie in the tunnel because we had Budweiser <laughs> ankle that game we, we, we missed that one <laughs> Yeah, yeah. there's a few, few who did that but no, it was... Um, it, it was uh, it was a it was a magnificent season really was fantastic in the way that it all ended up and and the way that it all came right for us yeah and then i've, I've got to ask you the follow the summer mm. just the move to preston yeah just felt um, professional decision yeah it was a professional decision i mean i had um i'd been on the same contract all the time i had a year left um we weren't we weren't getting close to agreeing terms um and again i, I just i remember how it all happened I'd, I'd made the decision myself and fred we didn't fall out about it we just said right okay you know I, I basically said i've got a year left let's take a chance if i do really well i might get headhunted if i'm rubbish he'll sack me and he don't have much to pay so we'll we'll just go for it and let's see what happens so I remember doing an interview one one morning in the off season with with Derek. Um, Derek came into my office and we did an interview. And he said, "Look, there's rumours about you leaving. Any truth in it?" And I said, "I, I don't know anything about it, Derek." I said, "I'd, I'd actually signed a couple of players. I'd signed um, Gawley, Kevin Gawl, Raven. I'd, I'd sent Kevin. I'd signed Kevin Gawl. I'd signed David Raven. I was planning for pre-season, mm -hmm. so I left. I went and met my mum in." Um, a little cafe, I don't even know if it's still open, celebrations in the middle of Carlisle, went and met my mum for a coffee and um, I get a phone call off Fred to say, 
um, I've accepted a compensation offer from Preston. Uh, you've got permission to go and speak to them. And I went, what do you mean a compensation offer? There's no compensation in my contract. He went, no, they've, they've agreed to compensate me. So I know you want to work in the championship. Go and speak to them and go and see what they have to say. And I sort of said, well, what about staying here? And he said, we spoke about it. We can't agree it. Go and speak to them and see what they say. And from there, I went down there. Uh, I was attracted to the, the opportunity to go there um, and, you know, let's get down to brass tacks as well. I was attracted by the finances that go with going to the championship. Um, it was a, a challenge. It was a job that I looked at and thought, you know, that I, I, could, go and, I could go and make a go of it. And um, I don't regret going. Um, I regret the things that happened um, after me going. I regret the... Uh, the abuse that my family took because of it um, but people people don't actually understand the way that it works you know the way that it's my job it's my career I needed to go and benefit and I always remember Dave Penny saying something to me as well Dave Penny was at Doncaster and they did a similar thing they went into conference they got up they got promotion back up the next level again and Dave said to me you got he'd already been sacked by Doncaster at this point and he said you, you have to make make sure you don't stay too long. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, when an opportunity comes, you have to choose the right one because if you stay too long, you'll get the sack and you'll miss your boat. So that was always in my mind as well. So I knew this was a chance to jump on a bigger boat and to try and move forward. And I'll be really honest with you. People said to me, how could you go to Preston? That we hate them. I'd been a Carlisle supporter all my life. I didn't know there was a massive rivalry between Carlisle and Preston. <laughs> no. I, I had no idea about this. Um, and, and these things, you know, listen, I, I, I'm, I regret all of the things that happened afterwards, but I still do believe it was the right thing to do, even though it didn't work out in the long run at Preston. I still believe it was the right thing to do. And also, if I'm going to be honest with you, I really think it was the right thing for Carlisle United to do as well, because... It, it actually it made Fred go and give a new manager probably more than he was prepared to give me, you know. And, and I helped Fred um, and the board appoint Neil McDonald. And again, people will have different opinions of Neil, but Neil was a really good manager for Carlisle United in the short time he was there. He came in and he and he brought a style of football. He brought a bit of success to it. And um, you know, I. I, I he was the first person I said to Fred, you know, when, when Fred said, who, who should we bring in to replace you? I said, well, it's a gamble, but speak to this guy. And he, he didn't. He spoke to about three or four and he rung me. He said, we still can't find anybody. And I said, oh, did you not like Neil? And he went, oh, I never spoke to him. I'll give him a call. And they interviewed him. And before Neil had even got back to Preston where he was living, he'd given it, Fred had rung him back and said, you've got it. So, you know, it's, um, I think it was the right thing for me. And I think it actually helped Carlisle a little bit in that Fred backed the new manager probably a bit more than he would have given me because he needed yeah. to prove it was the right thing to do to let me go. Plus, when you're getting a phone call saying compensation's been agreed, it's kind of, not so much that it hurts you, but myself, if I've been told that, I'm kind of, oh, well, OK, that there is a, an agreement there that they are happy to let you go. Not happy, but they're willing to mm. let you go, which kind of moves the goalpost a little bit as well. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there's, there's that side of it. But I, I mean, I, I think Fred, Fred's a businessman. And so he's looking at it from a business point of view. He can get rid of his manager and he can get some compensation for him. Um, and he was also a, he's a good bloke. And yeah. he knew that I wanted to go and test myself higher as well. So he, he was in a way it was twofold. He was trying to do me a favour. Um, even though I got slaughtered for it, and he was trying to do what was right for the football club, so you know I, I don't, um, I don't think it's a, anything bad on his part that he did it. Um, it, it was just he, he probably looked at the business side of it and thought, "Wow, this is a good deal here. We can go and yeah. do it." BBC Radio Cumbria Sport.